Well, there are understandable immediate concerns for young Heng Joon about his fate. Now, this is a serious charge he's facing. Can carry years in jail or even the death sentence. So the conditions we heard there about his detention are a real concern, harsh conditions, as the foreign minister herself put it today. But then there are the broader concerns about the relationship between Australia and China, which has been going through well, a fairly icy period. Uh, what um, impact is this going to have? Uh, you know, China's clearly ignored Australia's protests over this case. Its demands for some explanation, evidence against the Australian. Uh, now we see the Foreign Minister in return to this also issuing a fairly stern statement indeed. For more, I'm joined by Elaine Pearson, the Director at Human Rights Watch. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Look, what do we know about the conditions young Heng Jun uh, would have faced over the last seven months during his detention there? Well, we know very little about the specifics of his case, precisely because he's been held pretty much incommunicado. He hasn't had access to his lawyers, he hasn't had access um, to his family. But we do know that other people have been held in similar conditions under residential um, surveillance, which is the euphemistic term for the first six months. Often they're held uh, with the lights on 24-7. Sometimes they're forced um, to stand or sit um, in stress positions for long periods of time. They're interrogated very harshly, and obviously the purpose of this harsh treatment is to get them to confess to certain crimes. So we're very worried um, about Yang's um, state of mind and about his health and the fact that he hasn't had access uh, to, to lawyers or his family. That first six months of residential detention, as you put it, a euphemistic term, sounds a bit like home detention, but is not necessarily. Then he goes into the, the criminal detention. So what do we know about what that would have meant for the last month or so? Well, the criminal detention um, is somewhat better in that at least we know where he is, um, whereas with the residential surveillance, it's basically unauthorised areas of detention. It's like black sites. Um, but the treatment is not much better. Uh, Human Rights Watch has reported in many cases about how police have interrogated suspects very harshly, um, have used uh, various tactics to try and coerce confessions out of criminal suspects. And this is pretty much routine. And what we know, you know, with the opaque criminal justice system in China is that the courts will often convict suspects on the basis of these confessions that have been obtained through torture. And so we're very concerned that at this stage, after seven months, they're saying that they're moving ahead with the prosecution. Um, if they had this evidence at the beginning, why didn't they charge him at the start? Why did they wait seven months? So this, 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 tell, this tells you that after seven months of constant interrogation, daily inter interrogation, they may have finally cracked him, got some sort of confession so that they can announce today's arrest. Well, look, I mean, we simply don't know. We can only go off, um, you know, our experiences interviewing other people who've experienced the criminal justice system in China. Uh, but that certainly is our concern. And our concern is the complete lack of transparency, the secrecy um, around these proceedings. Um, and I think it is right that the Australian government has really stepped up um, its concerns. And, you know, we know that um, Yang is not the only person in this situation. We know that there's a couple of Canadians uh, also in, in a similar fate. And so I think it's, it's really up to governments um, that have their citizens in this situation really to band together and to join together to um, press the Chinese government to release these people. And I want to come to how that should be done. When it comes to the espionage charge, though, this is pretty serious. What's been the history, the experience recently with those foreign nationals? Well, I say foreign nationals, but perhaps we should look more specifically at dual nationals, because China does not recognise, essentially, uh, their dual nationality when they're there in China. If they're charged with espionage, what normally happens? Well, we know that in other cases, um, people have been charged with espionage or in some cases it's endangering uh, state security, endangering national security. Uh, but this is basically for peaceful acts of free expression. This is for saying stuff that the Chinese government um, doesn't like. And so that is, ex that is exactly our concern um, in this case. Espionage is slightly different. And of course, you know, there are um, some some differences, I guess, in Yang's case because of the fact that, you know, he previously worked for the Chinese government. However, you know, that time was a very long time ago. He's been, you know, arrested and released in the past. Um, we think it's very highly unlikely that this is um, about spying. The Australian government has said, you know, outright um, that he wasn't spying for Australia. So really, it seems that this is about sending a message to people who speak out um, against the Chinese government, who criticise the Chinese government, to show that we can do this to foreign citizens and to send a message not to do it. You mentioned earlier that uh, countries 
concerned about this need to band together and speak up. Just explain to me what you think the Australian government should now be doing. Well, look, I think, you know, it was positive to see a strong statement from the Foreign Minister, but obviously we need a unified approach across the whole government. Um, it's no good that, you know, trade ministers or others um, are not speaking from the same song sheet. So it's really important. Um, but also, I think, you know, ultimately, this isn't just about Australia. I think other governments like Canada, uh, New Zealand, Japan, um, you know, many governments who have also found their own citizens uh, facing similar concerns um, really need to band together and need to press the Chinese government to stop arbitrarily detaining people um, for, for simply peaceful acts of, of free expression. We're seeing how the Chinese government is becoming emboldened by the lack of international pressure on its human rights violations. And so we really need a consistent approach. Um, we've seen what's happening in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong. But, you know, the fact that Australian citizens who travel to China could potentially be at risk uh, for comments that they've made online, on blogs, um, for their writing is extremely concerning and is something that we need to take very seriously. Should the Australian government do more than uh, speak up about this? Should there be any sort of diplomatic or trade sanction? Well, look, I mean, I think... I think the Chinese government um, has a long history of human rights violations and absolutely there probably needs to be some talk about targeted sanctions for some of those violations, such as what is happening in Tibet and Xinjiang. I think this case is somewhat different and I don't think, you know, we're talking about economic uh, sanctions uh, for this case. But ultimately, I think it's really about any government official that is, you know, meeting with the Chinese government needs to be making representations on this case so that it's crystal clear what the Australian government position is. And I think, you know, those exchanges need to happen privately, but it's also important that they happen publicly. Otherwise, it's very easy for the government simply to dismiss um, Australia's, you know, to dismiss Australia's criticisms or not take it seriously.